Thank you for the introduction. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Catherine, and today I'm going to share uh, the work on studying the effects of sensory stimulation on cortical sensory motor processing in individuals with upper limb amputation. And this is joint work done at Johns Hopkins and the National University of Singapore. So here is an illustration of the brain. And when we think about a bidirectional neuroprosthesis, there are two distinct paths. One is from human brain to machine for generating motor movements. And the other path is from machine to human brain for some other sensory functions. And we term the latter system a machine to brain interface. And recent developments of sensory stimulation techniques in our lab and in others as well, uh, demonstrates the ability to elicit these touch-like phantom sensations that Luke just described in individuals with upper limb amputation. But here specifically, what we are interested in answering is the following question. That is, how does sensory stimulation affect and aid the perception of phantom sensations and movement at the cortical level? We are also motivated by several recent studies. And just to show an example, the work by Sereno showed that uh, through target muscle and sensory re-innovation surgery, it improves uh, functional connectivity between primary motor and somatosensory regions, but not with other higher order processing regions. And therefore, in our study, we want to focus on sensory motor interaction and multisensory processing using functional connectivity analysis. So this is the same or similar experimental paradigm we used EEG to record brain signals and transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation or TENS to elicit phantom sensations. And we asked each participant to associate TENS activity regions uh, with a particular hand movement. So at different stages of our EEG recording, the participant received different combinations of a visual cue to perform the hand movement and sensory stimulation to activate the corresponding regions in the hand. And we focused on stages one and three, that is making a hand movement with and without sensory stimulation. And we did this experiment with two amputee participants and three able-bodied participants. We made use of the temporal uh, resolution of EEG and selected the beta band activity. We constructed a dynamic brain now work first through source localization and then computing functional connectivity with a sliding window approach. And this gives us a dynamic functional connectivity network as shown in the cartoon here. So our experiment involved a visual cue, uh, sensory stimulation and motor movement. And we selected four functional systems that are relevant to our, our experiment shown in four colors. We focused on functional connections to the motor system. And here I want to highlight our results that show sensory stimulation inducing increased number of connection paths. And each circular plot here shows pairs of functional connections to the motor system that showed a significant increase with sensory stimulation. And the right and left of each plot indicate the right and left hemisphere. We observed that the paths that start from S1 and S2, so primary and secondary somatosensory, the blue bars indicated by numbers seven and eight, are to the premotor system, so numbers four and five. And in amputee participants, we further see a greater number of connections from the uh, multisensory processing region, the green bars, 10 and 11. And these increases suggest that sensory stimulation enhances functional connectivity between the somatosensory, multisensory processing, and motor regions. To further understand the temporal profile of the increased number of connection paths, we divided the total two seconds of experiment into three time intervals. And interestingly, we observed that the early phase showed the most increasing connection paths. And we observed that all paths from S1 to the motor increase in the early phase, while from S2 to motor, they show up mostly in the middle phase. And additionally, we observed that the extended increase in, is involved in multisensory processing regions over the first two phases, which further suggests that 
through stimulation, it recruits higher order processing regions to aid the subjects to complete the motor task. And so really brief summary, we show that sensory stimulation enhances functional interaction between the somatosensory, multisensory processing and motor systems. And these increases are most significant during the early phase of sensory stimulation. And here are a list of further questions for discussion, uh, including the multisensory uh, uh, integration, use of EEG and others. With that, I want to thank you for listening. Thank you, Catherine. And that's, uh, it's great to, to have uh, those questions as well to, for us to dwell on. But I do have a question for you. <laughs> and I noticed that the late um, activation phase brings in the visual networks. And so obviously that, yeah, there you go, uh, the late phase just on that top there in that first amputee subject. And I'm just wondering um, what would happen to, uh, to the system. And obviously the, 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 those visual systems are active initially early as well, because they're watching, you know, what, what's on the screen. But what, what do you think would happen if the person was actually moving, say with an auditory cue and they were asked to move uh, or, or, or think about moving the hand? Would, what kind of connectivity profile would you see then? Okay, um, I think, so, uh, in, if if we're blindfolding them with the uh, so they're they're without visual cue, but instead mm -hmm. using an auditory cue, mm -hmm. I think it's we would probably see a similar activation in the early phase because at first they are given this cue to make this movement, and it's possible that this uh, activation will kind of die down sooner. Uh, because for auditory, if they if it's just like a one moment uh, cue, then afterwards, if they're not receiving any other auditory, it's possible that we won't see auditory activation in the late phase as we see here in visual. Mm -hmm. But here, here's here's the uh, here's the kicker though. Mm -hmm. Do you think that they might also visualize even if you don't show them? Uh, the visual movement, do you think that in their mind's eye, whatever that thing might be, that you, they might be visualizing moving their hand and that you might actually see um, this late phase activity uh, in, the, in those visual regions? Is, would that be possible, do you think? That's really interesting thought. Um, <laughs> I think it will be... interesting if we actually observe this, but I, I do think it's it's possible. Um, it also, I think, kind of depends on what instruction we give them um, in terms of do, if we want them to actually imagine the movement if they're not seeing or if we want them to right. restrain from imagining this. Um, yep. That might create a difference. That would be really interesting to check out, I think. That would be really, really cool. Yeah. So, so do we, Gianna, do you want to ask um, Catherine a, a question about her work at all? No, you're good. Okay, very good. Okay, so we, 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 um, we have a very shy audience here. So uh, perhaps, Catherine, you might want to go to the questions, the discussion questions, just to, to so any, any of the three of you can jump right in about uh, what, which one would you uh, like us to tackle first, Catherine? I think in general, it would be really interesting to think about how do we really incorporate uh, multiple sensory modalities in terms of uh, rehabilitation for these uh, participants and how can we make use of them in a long-term way? Yeah. Yeah, and so when when you uh, say that, are you are you thinking of um, having a naturalistic type of paradigm for experimentation, or are you thinking more of um, nailing things down with set kind of um, auditory and visual kind of stimuli? Talk a little bit about what how you might see that unfolding. Yeah, I think. Initially, we might start something like more, more in a lab setting where with, with set and pretty 
unnaturalistic uh, cues. But later on, it'd be interesting to look at how, uh, if, if we're in a more natural, naturalistic setting or an actual daily living situation, um, what can we use, make use of these um, stimulation modalities? Okay. Okay, Catherine, now you do have a question from, uh, from our audience and they, they say, hi, great talk, thank you. Were the sensory percepts only tactile or were you able to elicit the sense of any movement or proprioception within the phantom limb? That's an interesting question. Yeah, um, I think from our experiments, most of the sen sensations elicited were just tactile. And because we were asking the participants to associate um, activated regions in the hand with the movement, they kind of think about where in the hand uh, they feel when they're making a certain movement, but I, I wouldn't uh, necessarily say that that is proprioception. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you for asking that question. And we have another one, the question actually coming in von, from Hannah Block. Do you have any ideas about what multisensory activity is contributing to motor cortex? Okay. Um, I think if I, if I understand the question correctly, I think uh, for multisensory processing in, this, in our study, it is mostly visual tactile um, and here we are terming it as uh, mostly just kind of a place in the brain that uh, incorporates both uh, visual information and tactile information uh, in, in our case. And so for further uh, experiments, it will be interesting to actually uh, introduce multisensory integration, which kind of gives them a visual feedback of what they're actually doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's a really good good way to do it, and maybe to do, and and maybe to have tasks that have different grains, granularities of re, of of spatial resolution too, um, you know, ones that are, that have uh, grosser motor movements, ones that may be maybe have finer motor movements. Perhaps that might also be uh, something interesting to to uh, go for. That's, that's really, really fascinating, really, really fascinating work. Um, and, um, okay, so we've, we've talked about uh, multiple sensory modalities. Do you mind if I Sorry, ask Luke. a question to um, Catherine? So do you, do you have a sense of if certain hand movements might um, create more, say, increased connectivity than other types of movements, right? So you showed that uh, sometimes like um, uh, the participants saw different hand movements, um, but if you just picked out a few hand movements, would you expect some to be better than others and creating some enhanced connections or are they all um, more or less equal? Um, I think in our analysis, we kind of grouped all the movements together. And so if a participant made two movements uh, in different trials, we just group them together. Um, if we look at movement-based activity, it's it's possible to see differences, but also I would think that we might not have the fine resolution to actually distinguish those. Okay. Okay. Well, I think um, we're probably ready to, to move on. Thank you, uh, Catherine, for, for that. And that was a very interesting discussion. But thank you, everyone, for weighing in. And uh, now we move to uh, Gianna Canessa.